Good morning. We're going to begin um, by reading today's scripture. Will you stand with me, please? In honor of God's word, it should be on the screen. Here we go. You could read with me, please. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, and you and your children within your walls, they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him, yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today is Palm Sunday, and to, we are going to do what congregations every year at this time all over the world do. We're going to explore the story of, that's called the triumphal entry. This is one version that we read. This story can actually be found in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Luke's is a little bit different. You may have noticed you didn't hear about the palm branches in this one. You didn't hear about Hosanna. Blessed is he. Well, we, they did say blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But you didn't hear Hosanna. And you didn't hear about the cloaks. And you didn't hear about the donkey. We're going to get there. Before we really dive into the story, though, I, there are a couple things that I, I want to I point out. So before I was a pastor... I was actually an English teacher. Now, some of you, when, you, when English, an English teacher comes to mind, you think of grammar, and you think, why in the world would anyone want to spend their life studying grammar and then making other people study grammar? It's, somebody just said, yeah. Well, here's the thing. As fascinating as grammar is, and I can tell you the way we use our language actually is really interesting. It really is. Um, most English teachers, though, become English teachers because they love story. They love story. So they teach stories, and they learn stories, and they lead people through story. And the story we're looking at today is not actually a story at all. It's just a little piece of a story. It can't stand on its own. This is, this is just a little vignette. So a good story um, follows what we English teachers call a story arc or a narrative arc. And a, and a good narrative arc has five to eight points along the arc. If I were to show it to you, it would look like a bell curve, an, ups, you know, an upside down, like that. And um, it starts, a good story always starts with an exposition. Don't you love all these big words? What that means is an introduction. You get to know the characters. The, the setting, the place, the time. It just, it just sort of lays out for you where we are. And then, from there, after we've met the hero and possibly the anti-hero, there will be a triggering event. Something that happens that lets you know that there is going to be action. There is more to this story. Right? And after the triggering event comes the building, the rising action. The story is moving somewhere. 
the tension gets thick. But we're not quite to the top yet, because right before the climax, the big thing, the battle for good and evil, comes a critical moment. It's usually called the critical choice, and it comes right before the battle for good and evil, the big climax. And after the climax comes the reversal. For better or worse, things are never the same again. The hero can never go back to being the same person, never go back to whatever happened before. And after the reversal comes the denouement, the falling action and the resolution. So why did I just tell you all that? Because, as I told you, the passage we're looking at is just part of a story. Just a little vignette, but it's a pivotal vignette, this point. The, the story that this story, that this little vignette is a part of, is a larger story, the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is, in fact, part of an even larger story, the story of God's relationship with his creation. Now, <clears throat> that story, that overarching story, the story of the creator and the creation, that is an important story, and it's one in which we each find our own story. Our stories are influenced by and contained within this one grand story. In this overarching story, God is the protagonist, the hero. And um, he's the creator. The setting is eternity. Now, that may seem like a very strange setting to you. It's just the time, but we don't really have a place yet. The setting is eternity. God is creating the place. So God begins doing what creators do. He starts creating. He creates the entire universe, everything that is, everything that exists. And he does it step by step, exactly the way it needs to be done. And he does it in order, and he does it by speaking it into existence. The word of God brings forth all of creation. And it's good. In fact, it's very good. And then comes the trigger, the triggering event. It turns out that um, some of God's creatures decide to rebel against the created order. Apparently, some of these creatures were designed the ones who were specifically designed to reflect God's glory and participate in God's work, those creatures were designed to be able to influence the story, to have free will. They were given agency, and they chose poorly. Their choices, have been, their choices then have catac cataclysmic repercussions. The choices of these one set of creatures affects every other creature, every other created thing. They usher in death and decay. Rather than stewarding and tending to the, wor to the world, to creation, and to each other, they began using, competing, comparing, exploiting. They reject the creator in favor of ruling themselves. They reject life-giving ways in favor of temporary personal gain. They reject, in essence, their createdness. Now, they know the creator has blessing, and they totally want that. But they don't want to submit to the creator. In an effort to be free of any rule, they become slaves. Slaves to their own self-centered desires. Slaves to what we call sin. Over and over again, they try to obtain God's blessing. They try to obtain favor. They try to obtain good in their own way. And over and over again, they fail miserably. And they cry out. 
They cry out for salvation, for a Savior, and God answers. God is not done with creation. God has a plan. Because these creatures weren't designed to be externally controlled like puppets or toys. External guidelines and rules only reveal the depth of their depravity, the extent of their brokenness, and how short they fall from the goodness for which they were created. So instead, Creator God will enter into creation to redeem it and remake it from the inside out. So God is birthed into the world by the power of God's own Spirit in the person of Jesus Christ. God gets right down in the middle of his fallen creation, puts on flesh, comes right down, right where all the creation is. He experiences life on earth. And when he's grown, he begins, he begins to do the work he came to do. He begins healing binding up wounds, setting people free from evil spirits, opening eyes and ears, loosing tongues. He begins teaching people what life is really all about. He begins teaching them that the blessing they seek comes through repentance, through turning. He teaches them that they need to acknowledge that they cannot achieve the blessing on their own. They cannot get the good life they long for on their own. They need to acknowledge that they're poor, that they need to mourn over what they've done and what they've lost. Jesus teaches that blessing comes to the meek, to those who stop seeking success and self-advancement and instead hunger for righteousness. Blessing comes to those who are merciful and pure in heart, to those committed to peace, to those who are willing to sacrifice to achieve peace. Blessing, he says, comes through persecution. Now, Jesus not only teaches this new way of life, the kingdom way of God, he lives it out. Jesus lives what it means to truly be human the way God created human beings to be. And people are drawn to him. They are drawn to the light, called to the life that's emanating from Jesus, and they begin to follow. They begin to listen. They're curious about this meek man who has the ability to calm storms, restore bodies, This man who includes the outcast and the lowly, who forgives sins, who brings sinners back into fellowship. This man who can even raise the dead. They want to know this man whose words are like a healing balm and a refreshing drink for a parched and weary soul. They wonder... Is this the one that God has sent to save us? Is this our salvation, this man? And they ask, are you the Savior we asked for? And Jesus answers, yes, I am the way. Yes, I am the truth. Yes, I am the life. Yes, I am the good shepherd. Yes, I am the gate. Yes, I am the resurrection and the life. Yes, I am. But oddly, not everyone is able to hear his answer. Not everyone receives it. So now we're coming to the vignette, the Palm Sunday part of the story, the critical moment. The suspense has built. Jesus has an enormous following. He's approaching Jerusalem. The characters are taking shape, and they're taking sides. There are, in essence, four camps of characters. There's Jesus. He stands alone. 
He's our hero. The disciples, which includes the 12 and the others who are following wholeheartedly, even though they don't really understand what Jesus is saying, they're, they're accepting it by faith and they're following. But then there's the crowd and the religious leaders. The followers have grabbed onto the word. They fell in love with Jesus and they've fallen in love with him and they're following. The crowd are those who are excited to see what will happen. They love being in on all the miracles. And they're, they're along for the ride as long as things go the way it, they're expected to go, as long as everything's good. And then you have the religious leaders. The religious leaders are suspicious, skeptical. They actually understand a little bit more of what Jesus is saying, but they love their chains more than the truth. You see, everyone who was watching Jesus wondering, is this, is this the Savior? Everyone had their own idea of what Messiah would be, what a Savior would look like. People never actually forgot the Creator, even though they turned away from him. Now, some people did decide to flat out deny that there was a creator or pretend God didn't exist. Or they made up their own gods so that they could go about their life the way they wanted to. But others couldn't pretend that God didn't exist. They knew they needed a creator. They knew they were designed for relationship with creator God. So they, they did all they could to please the creator. And some even devoted their lives to pleasing God and to guiding others to God. But their idea of a savior didn't quite match up with God's idea of a savior. These people couldn't envision a savior who wasn't like themselves, who wasn't in their camp. They couldn't envision a kingdom that wasn't like the one they had helped create. Their idea of a savior was to return to the glory days. This was a brief time in their history when they seemed to be on top. When it seemed like they and God had come to an agreement, a compromise of sorts. They got to have a king and an earthly kingdom and be well respected by everyone around them. God, God can choose the king. He gets to choose the king. And, um, But they could get to have their kingdom, right? And God would bless them. God could bless them. That was the idea. And they wanted to go back to those glory days, the days of David, the days of Solomon. The problem is this Jesus character, he was not following the script. He wasn't the savior who was taking them back. Now, he had influence. They would give him that. People were drawn to him, following him, hanging on his words, as the scripture we just read said. He had power, obviously. He was casting out evil spirits, feeding multitudes with crumbs. He had even raised the dead. But he wasn't using this power the way he was supposed to. He was preaching surrender and meekness and, and persecution. He was criticizing the religious leaders and ignoring the larger political issues that needed to be dealt with in order to get them back to where they belong. What they didn't understand is creators don't go back. Creators move forward. Creators create forward. And they were moving forward. This story was moving somewhere. It was headed toward new creation. It was headed toward new life. In our little vignette, this story, we find Jesus headed toward Jerusalem. Jerusalem was really significant because two things could be found there the temple, 
and the palace, the seat of worship and the seat of authority. Where would Jesus go? The crowds following Jesus were at an all-time high. They believed he was the Savior. It looked like they were ready to make him king. They would have carried him straight to the palace. But they failed to notice that Jesus did not ride in on a white horse the way a conqueror would. He rode in on a donkey, a colt, a symbol of peace. They cried out, Hosanna, which means save us. They cried out for a savior. They laid down their cloaks and palm branches. They waved palm branches. Palm branches. Symbols of victory and freedom. A symbol that had once adorned the coins in their kingdom when they were on top. They cried, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Did they understand? Did they know the truth that they spoke? Did they know that Jesus had come, not just as a representative of God, but as God wrapped in flesh? Did they realize that he was their savior? Our passage that we read today leads us to believe that perhaps not. As he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. Why would a conquering king weep over the city? He said, if you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. Jesus wept because he knew what was going to happen. He wept because he knew they didn't recognize the time of God's coming to them. They didn't know. They couldn't see it. Their excitement was over what they thought must be happening. It was almost frenzied. The tension was palpable. What would Jesus do next? And then comes the surprise. Jesus does not go to the palace. He doesn't address those currently in power. He goes to the temple. This is a significant plot twist. The temple is the heart of worship. This place represents the heart of the people. Though they don't see it, they don't understand it, Jesus is saying that this, this, the seat of worship, this is where he will reign. He will reign from the heart. And Jesus begins by cleaning house. He entered the temple area and began driving out those who were selling. There were money changers for visiting foreigners, merchants selling doves and lambs, sacrifices for the feast, sacrifices needed to atone for sins, needed to be made right with God. They were doing all of this in the outer court. This was the only place a Gentile could come, the only place an outsider could pray. They were so caught up in doing religious business that they pushed prayer out. They took space set aside for prayer and they turned it into a marketplace. Jesus said, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. In more ways than one, they had robbed people of the ability to approach God. But Jesus... Jesus entered the city on the very day for choosing the Passover lamb. The lamb whose blood had once adorned doorposts in order to save them from the angel of death. Jesus drove out the other sacrifices, the incomplete sacrifices, the ones that had to be offered over and over again, and offered himself instead. He drove those out, and he settled in. He set up right in the temple, and he began healing and teaching, offering restoration and truth free of charge. People were amazed at his teaching. But where was this going? 
Jesus had just completely upset the status quo. The religious leaders were not happy. Our scripture tells us they were now trying to kill Jesus, to get rid of him. Those who made money selling in the temple, they were obviously not happy. The current rulers, Herod and the Romans, looked on suspiciously, not thrilled with what was going on. Those who expected a king and an end to political oppression and a return to glory were watching those expectations dissolve. This piece of our story, it's a transitional piece. It's a pivotal piece. This vignette leads us right up to the critical choice. What will they do with Jesus? The story isn't over here. And there will be no resolution this Sunday. We are only left with rising action and suspense. We don't even get to the climax. But this story begs us to ask the same question of ourselves. It leads us to the exact same critical choice. What will we do with Jesus? What will we do with a Savior who will not follow the script? who will simply not be the savior that we've all imagined? Are we willing to move forward? To accept the savior who has arrived? To move forward with him and follow all the way? Or are we determined to hold on and return to the past and wait for what we've been expecting? What we think a savior should look like? What you choose determines where you find yourself in this story. As we will be reminded in the coming week, following forward in faith will not be easy. It won't be what you expect. Because God's plans are not our plans. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. But God's ways are good. Very good. So will we choose the God of the temple, the one who wants to rule our hearts, who wants to offer restoration and redemption from the inside out? Or will we hold out for the God of the palace, a God of our own making, who will change the circumstances around us so our lives look like what we expect blessing to look like? Will we cry Hosanna and recognize that Jesus, our Savior, has come in the name of the Lord. The critical choice is this. Will you allow Jesus to be God and Savior? Will you allow your Savior to be the Savior that God has sent you? Or will you hold out for another Savior? Pray with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have sent your son, that you have come in the flesh, that we cried out in our need for a savior, and you responded. We thank you. We praise you. Lord God, give us faith to accept you your salvation the way you want to give it. Give us faith to allow you to be God, to allow you to reign from the throne of our hearts. We cry out, Hosanna, save us. And you have answered, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Give us faith to accept this today, Lord Jesus. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. I'm going to leave you with the suspense. This week, I hope you come back and walk the road with the stations of the cross, remembering what Jesus has done for us. I hope you meet us on Good Friday. 
as we see what our good, good God did. And I hope you come back next Sunday for the climax of the story. Go in peace.